Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Magic Brad Show here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I've got some friends that we pulled together here. They're all professional speakers, have been on the stage. I haven't uh, gotten through their whole website of all their accolades and things, but we've got Steve Donofrio. Did I pronounce that right, Steve? Donofrio? Yeah, it's Donofrio, but we'll take it. Donofrio. <laughs> I was calling you Donofrio. That, That's that, okay. Most that people do. And then Patrick Manyboon, and I call him Patrick Courage because that's what he speaks on, right? Thank <laughs> Patrick you. Patrick Manyboon. And Daryl Glaze. How you doing, Daryl? Doing good. How about you, Brad? It's a wonderful day to be above ground, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So it's good to have all you guys together here. And here we are all living in the general area of the Twin Cities. And, you know, the whole world has made an incredible shift because I know you guys speak on stage and I'll bet a lot of your booked engagements are no longer because of this pandemic creates stress. Where's my money going to come from? I was going at it full ahead with the, the event industry and all of a sudden they told me I can't do events anymore. So what do you mm -hmm. do? You know, so we're doing yeah. this online thing. We're social distancing, you know, we're, I think, uh, Steve, you're down in Eden Prairie. Daryl, where are you? I'm out in uh, Invergrove Heights. Way over there east. And then Patrick? I'm right across the border in Hudson, Wisconsin. Oh, a foreigner. <laughs> I'm a foreigner. <laughs> Border crossing. Can't you tell that I have an accent? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, what we're going to all talk about is some of the current events that are happening right now. There's a lot of stuff going on, you know, with the whole coronavirus that's been kind of global and it's just made us think totally differently. And then, you know, the recent stuff that has happened with the riots and the, I think that stems kind of from the being pigeonholed up in your, in one spot and people are getting stressed out and tense. And we're trying to figure out how can we fix that? How can we make it better? Some people have their one opinion, other people have their other opinion. And the, the buzzword nowadays, it's kind of to be, it's, it's like social justice what is justice we got social distancing social media now there's social justice so i was going to go kind of around let each one of you kind of introduce yourself and say kind of more about just a little bit so we get to know who you are um steve works with uh, more in the area of confidence patrick works in courage and daryl works in motivation and recovery so steve could you give us just a brief real short one or two minute bio of yourself Sure. Thanks, Brett. We appreciate being here. It's really fun to be hanging out with uh, Patrick and Daryl as well. We kind of hang out on Tuesdays anyway, so this is kind of a fun time. Uh, I'm kind of new to uh, speaking in the Twin Cities as after 15 years in Japan. And I do uh, talk a lot about confidence and especially where it has to deal with leadership. And so talking to leaders about kind of bringing people together to get things done is the main theme and building confident leaders or leaders who build confidence in others uh, as well. So a lot about really kind of, again, going back to bringing people together. How do we connect with people who look, think, believe different than us to come together to get things done? Those are my main themes and main passions these days as I go around speaking. Okay, yeah. Leadership, definitely there's different types of leadership. You know, some people say it's more militant type leadership and others it's like acting <laughs> uh, and people will just follow you if you just act that character, or that they have that characteristic. So Mr. Courage, Patrick Menaboon, could you give us a little brief uh, a synopsis of your, your speaking and what you talk about as far as the word of courage? Yeah, when it comes to my lane, I, I speak on courage, specifically self-mastery and um, self-responsibility. The background of that is a lot of people are stuck in this thing I call insecurity loop. And when, when you are stuck in a loop like that and you don't have or coach or mentor or leader so, so somebody that can challenge your thoughts your decision your choices 
we become stuck, become like this. You know, we, we stand in the middle of the road. And in the process, sometimes we start to blame everything else that happened in our lives and you know, blame everyone else. And so it's courage to take control of your life because I believe we were created to be creators, not spectators. So it, it is courage, courage to own your life, courage to own your decisions. And that's, that's, that's pretty much what I speak on. Absolutely. I think it takes a lot of courage if, uh, you know, you've got one opinion and you've got other people with other opinions. It takes courage to, to, to not have a combat with it. Right. And kind of stay, like you said, stay in your lane with it. Yes. And also to stand up for what you believe in. You know, it takes some courage. Yes. So, Mr. Darrell, let's talk about motivation and recovery. I was looking on your website, and I watched you've got some uh, nice YouTube videos up there. And uh, I'm a non-drinker myself, so I've been through the recovery thing, and don't touch the stuff. So I uh, appreciate uh, the, the work that you do in that area, because uh, once you clear a lot of that stuff out of the way, you start seeing clearer. <laughs> Could you just share a little bit about yourself and, uh, and how you, uh, what you talk about? Well, as a matter, as, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you're able to clear that stuff out the way, you can see things a lot differently. And from what I do is that I'm a motivational speaker, but I'm also a recovery coach. So I've worked with recovering addicts for, over, for just about 20 years now. And in that process, one of the things I've found is that the ones who are successful are the ones who, dis who made the decision to understand that life is more than just recovery. They realize that you have to have something more than just focus on recovery all the time. You have to learn how to build a life. And, and it's in that process where a recovering addict can fall so easily because they don't know how to stay motivated. So what I like to do is I like to motivate recovering addicts to get from where they are to where they desire to be in life, to be that bridge between the gap to get them to the next level that they have in store for their lives. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 some odd years. And now, being able to help people uh, not moved into a little different genre as well. But now I'm not just helping the recovering addict, but I'm also helping the people who love them uh, with, with, one of the, with one of the things that I'm doing called from enabling the coach, helping your loved one through the journey of recovery. You know, this is pretty fascinating with uh, you guys all have some, um, talks that are quite different, but they all kind of kind of blend in with each other. They kind of overlap and parlay and it's like with the recovery kind of thing, you got to get clear and then you can, you, you need to motivate and keep that thing moving. You can't just sit in the swamp and be stagnant because then you, like you said, you start blaming other people for things because you're in your own little, little box here. So it's fun that you guys are all kind of blending together with all the things that I wanted to talk about and the, the topic is the whole concept of social uh, justice and like all the things that are happening, what is just and, and whose fault is it? Is it anybody's fault or is it really on us to kind of decide? And I bet we all have different opinions of that. So I'm wondering if we could all go through and kind of explain what they feel true change is in this, uh, this situation. Personally, myself, the way that I deal with most things is I sit in the middle. I sit in the place of peace. I don't go way over on the left or way over on the right and try and polarize because that's part of the problem. I mean, we've got a democracy and that's part of the problem there. It's the politics, the polls. And when you get so stuck in your spot and so stuck in the other spot, all you can do is argue. So I like to kind of sit in the middle and kind of look and get different people's opinions because different opinions, I, I've always said opinions change with circumstances. Like what's right. more valuable, a hundred dollar bill or a glass of water? Depends <laughs> on where you are. If you're in the desert, I want the water, you know? If I'm at the club, I want the money. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, could you go first and kind of express what you think, what would you see true change as being in this situation here? Yeah, that's a really, it's a loaded question and I think it's going to come down to individual people, and Patrick brought this up before, and it's about responsibility. One of the things I see as true change is when we as individuals begin to take 
more responsibility and say, you know what, I may be part of the problem. What can I do to fix it? Or I may be part of the solution, so what action can I take? And so taking more responsibility on where we stand, and part of that to me, true change is when we begin to understand ourselves and others in a deeper way and begin to truly listen with an ear to learn. Not just listen to appease or listen to make somebody feel good, but really listen to learn and then take what we've learned and begin to apply that to our own personal lives. So instead of saying, oh, personal responsibility is important, and I know just the person who needs to hear that message. <laughs> you know, that's not what we need. We need personal responsibility that says, look, I'm going to look in the mirror today and figure out what I can do to be part of that. To me, that's what change begins when we take that responsibility and listen. And like you said, Brad, it's, you know, staying in the middle, but not staying in the middle because we're avoiding conflict or we're not staying in the middle to avoid or hide. We're actually bringing people together to the middle, so to speak. We have to start bringing people together. And I think true change happens when we stop self-segregating so much. Well, I, and that's kind of where I stand uh, right now on change. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Patrick and Daryl on these things. And because I know we've had good conversations in the past and about these topics. And I just, again, personal responsibility is such a big thing for me. And we can't have change without it. Well, I totally agree. Just like one of the topics of things that are happening, there's all this uh, illegal alien border crossing thing. And granted, some of the people that cross might be drug dealers. The other people that are crossing might be trying to run away from, you know, they're, they're from danger. So how do you deal with that? And when people sometimes don't accept personal responsibility for what's actually going on, and they just start pointing fingers and pointing blame, I mean, with the the border crossing thing, and some people say, don't let them in, or they should be here. If they should be here, would you let them into your house? Now you got personal responsibility. So maybe there's a different place where somebody can be protected. And everybody's got different opinions for it. So I think, I think it's important that we kind of stay in the middle and kind of hear both sides and what is the issue? How can we maybe fix it together as opposed to beating down the other person? I'm about collaboration, not about competition. So Patrick, yeah. You awake? Of course. I'm you still here. I'm still here. <laughs> okay, can we hear from you what you think the the true change would be? You know, um I am a believer in what the old book says that we were created in the image of God. And that's where it stopped. It didn't say what color of God, what complexion what God looks like. We were created in the image of God. That's where it stopped. And there is a beautiful book by Stevie Covey. What is it? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yep. Number one, proactive. And, and basically, Steve spoke to, you know, the dad also. Proactive and part of that include wanting to understand first then before and then you can try to be understood yeah but i think we have gotten to the point in our culture our society where it's all you know each and every one thing somebody owes them something like the kids nowadays their parents owe them, their grandparents owe them stuff. And these grow up to be adults who feel entitled. Entitled, it is not my responsibility to walk across the street and say hello to my neighbors. It's my neighbor responsibility to come and see me because, oh, I am brand new here. So everybody should come. Who cares? Who cares what the color of your skin is? Who cares? Oh, I'm a guy who stutters. Oh, really? Who cares? So what? It's, it, it goes back to that being proactive, trying to understand why 
somebody thinks the way they think or what somebody it is not so much about what the issue is is how we respond to it and so when it comes to true change in my opinion it's basically what you know we have to become 10 which is much greater than one one is you you know, you know, you have to do this on, on, until you do that, until you change the name of a football team, until you bring down all of these statues, until you bring down the whole country, nothing is going to change. The question is, who can I become? Who can I, 10, evolve into? Who can I, you know, grow into to effect change, whatever the definition of change is? But that's the scary part, Brad because it's incumbent upon me to grow, to learn interpersonal skills, to learn how to engage people. Ah, that's too hard. It's easy to just point hand and go to all of the demographics, you know, race, politics. Those are easy way out. True change starts with who can I evolve into to affect what I want to affect in society. Well, that's it. I liked what you said, the Stephen Covey thing, the seek to understand, then to be understood kind of thing. Because if you don't know why your neighbor's not coming over, you know, maybe they don't want you over because they're doing some hanky panky in the bedroom or something. So maybe that's why they don't come over. So you need to understand exactly. what's going on in their head. Why are they not doing certain things? And like these statues and things, instead of just going and tearing it down, let's find out why you want, why do you want to have that torn down? If you have more conversation, why do you want to keep it up? And if you understand, maybe you could convert the statue into something new, perhaps. You, you can repurpose it to make your point. Yeah. But I'm thinking in my mind, you change the name of the Redskin, you turn out all this. How does it help the kid in not many apples who is hungry? How yep. does it help Chicago, where people are dying on a daily basis? Why are we just conforming to what people want us to think is the issue because it benefits their pocket? Yeah, they're, they're maybe too much into symbolism and concerned about symbols, and they should start thinking about more motivated activism instead of activism by blocking a freeway. Why not motivate? Why not activate by going and feeding hungry people? Good point. Take, take action, which kind of segues us into Daryl about motivation. So Daryl, you know about motivation and um, why don't you tell us a little bit your opinion of what true change would look like because you need to take action. You can't just think it. You need to do something where the rubber hits the road, right? You know, the first place for action that needs to take place is that if I would borrow a, a, a line from, uh, from, recovery, from recovery, is that you have to take personal inventory. What is it about your situation and what have you, when, when about everything about what is your personal inventory? What's your personal stake in your own life that, that is causing or can be the solution to all of this? And we need to take personal inventory about what are we doing? Are we the part of the solution or part of, or part of the problem? Her taking that personal inventory, finding out what it is that's on the inside of your heart about what is it that needs to take place and when the, uh, and needs to happen. Patrick Todd talked about you know seeking to seeking to understand be first be first be understood, then actually be a, be a, be understanding. But the thing is is that it's important that we first take the first step of action, taking that personal inventory in us, you know, to realize that it's real easy to point the finger at a tangible devil than it is to point the finger at us where the change really needs to take place. Isn't that uh, like uh, there's a speck in your eye and there's a log in your, oh, yeah. another person's eye, there's a log in yours, something like that? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, when we, and until we get there, it's gonna be hard for change to come because, you know, for lack of, it's been going, listen, this is not something new. No. Wow. This has been going on for for decades, generations, you name it. This is not anything new. Every solution has never been brought, the solution, true solution has never come up because it's a bigger problem than what everybody is, 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 is conforming to. 
one of the things people need to understand is that the root cause of this problem is a sin issue. Whether you want it, whether you believe in God or not, listen, it's a sin issue, okay? Rac racism has been around since the beginning of time. Whether it was white on white, black on black, black versus white, you know, whatever. It's been around for ages. This is not new. Right. All right? And, and, and yet, although it's not new, everybody's trying to throw the same solution at it. That never works. Everybody is talking, but nobody's saying anything. Correct. And that's where our problem lies. Nobody's sitting down and saying, look, okay, obviously what we're doing is not working. So how do we revamp our thinking into a place where we can realize that it first starts with us before it starts with our race, before it starts with the community, before it starts with each other? It first starts with us. Check your own heart. Find out if you're actually doing the right thing or not. Yeah, you said it happened a long, long time ago. Um, I think it happened when that apple, you bit that, they, they bit that apple and all of a sudden it went like this and goes good and evil. And all of a sudden we got a left and a right and we got duality and we got Republicans and Democrats and we got blacks and we got whites and there's this polarity going on. And you got to get back to that, that neutral place, I believe, and hear both sides and get an idea of where it is so we can come to a place of peace. Um, you know, there's all this crazy I would I took a drive down after the riot thing me and my wife we drove down there in broad daylight and kind of just looked at some of the stuff and the places that are boarded up and the stuff that you don't see on the news is stuff like a boarded up place that says please don't burn children sleeping upstairs mm. you spray it paint you don't see that on the news wow. but that's the kind of stuff that's giving me chills right now because that's what there's people that are dying because they're pissed off at a building <laughs> you know and there is a powerful story about you know you know Daryl has a powerful story that he told. If he can just mention it, that would be great. I, you know, I, I bought his mom who go into school and, and we're working at you know Target and it Target gets burned down. Can you please mention that story? You know, Daryl. I was talking with a young man. Uh, this is right. This is right after the riots, and he was very hot and intense about his about his view about uh, about not only Black Lives Matter but also his view about uh, that we should be rioting, we should be we should be burning things down. And I was trying to explain to him is that you know I, I've been around just a tad bit longer than you, and I can tell you never in the history of our of society have burning down our own stuff ever proved any point. It, to the point where it's fixed anything. And he would went on and on to tell me about all these different things that he thought was right to do, which basically had more to do with lawlessness than it had to do with justice. So I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, what about uh, Mrs. Evans? And he said, Mrs. Evans? Said, who is Mrs. Evans? I said, well, Mrs. Evans is a woman I heard a story about who actually worked at that Target for about five years that was raising three babies on her own going to school full time and she was one year away from getting her nursing degree. Her, that target burned down where she worked. The store that she went to buy her groceries was also burned down. Now she has to take a bus to the other side of town, which by the way, the bus system wasn't working at that time. So now there's no way to feed her baby. So here she is as, a, as an African American single mom trying to raise her children trying to feed them and take care of him. Let me ask you a question. How much do you believe she believes in your Black Lives Matter now? And he, uh, he looked at me and said, well, you know, that's just, that's just part for cause. You know, it's just something that, uh, it's just something that happens. You know, it just, it's just part of the damage. I was like, really? Is, is that where we are? Where we are thinking that's just, just part of the, uh, Part, part of the, the uh, carnal or part of the, uh, collateral, the collateral damage, damage so to speak. Uh, I mean, if, that, if that's the kind of thinking that we're doing, where is the solution going to come in all this? Right. Well, they how, say, long uh, do we, how long do we have to still point at, tangib at tangible devils and blame this person, that person, this president, that president, all these different things? I heard a comment. I was down in Chicago last week, and I heard a comment 
uh, which I thought was very interesting. They said that that the problems that have have, have been around for for decades stems from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I said, now wait a minute. There's been a lot of people who who have occupied 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which is the White House. So how can we blame one person for a problem that's been around before that person was even around? It goes deeper than that, folks. Yeah, and and it is it's an interesting point. You know, there are one of the most admired people in the world, and he will always be one of the most admired people, is Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And and it doesn't matter what the skin color is. They, this, this, this guy accomplished a lot. He accomplished significantly. But the, the one thing my mom told me when I came to the United States in 1999 was learn how to beat the system. And that's what this guy did. He learned how to beat the system and went to the highest office in the land. But unfortunately, he and a lot of these people who have ascended the mountains I still telling that little 10 year old kid down there, oh, it, you will never climb up this mountain because the mountain is so much against you. Why don't you teach the kid, irrespective of what the, the, the complexion, or why don't you teach the kid how to beat the system, whether the system was put in place by a black person or a yellow person, regardless of the complexion of the system, teach folks how to beat the system, period. You think um, maybe some people don't have the confidence, I'm kind of segueing into Steve here, the confidence to stand up for what they believe in. And, and instead of doing it like burning down a building, that's symbolic, but what does it really do? It, it destroys, it doesn't, doesn't grow, it doesn't solve the problem. It just states that I'm very angry about it. But it maybe some people do that because they don't have the confidence to actually do something productive. It's much easier. It's much easier to break a plate than it is to make the plate. You know? mm. so yeah, really I agree. And I think too, that, well, both Patrick and Daryl said it. And I love how Daryl said a personal inventory. That's to me one of those st step one of confidence is knowing where you're starting from. It's like a computer. You have to have a default. And if you don't know your right now default, how do you know where you want to go or when it's not or when it's not working? So a confidence is a skill set. It's not a belief or an attitude. And you get confidence by doing things. A professional athlete gains confidence by doing repetitions on whatever it is you're doing. If you want to be, Brad, you're a magician. If you want to be a confident magician, you're not going to be confident day one out there. I can't shuffle a deck of cards and make you pick one and whatever it's going to be. I have to practice the skills. As I practice that, I become more confident, whatever skill that is. And so confidence becomes the concept of perfecting your practice, so to speak. But we have to perfect our practice when it comes to how we think and how we deal with other people and our mindsets. And both Patrick and Daryl have said it. It's about, I like how Patrick said, we're beating the system. It's getting the system. It's understanding. So we develop that confidence, but we, we can't be confident if the message changes all the time. If we're always giving a new message because the tides are shifting and the wind is blowing and one day this is good and one day this is bad and say, I can eat bacon today, but not tomorrow. And oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, fat is good for you. Fat is bad for you. <laughs> we are blown backwards and forwards and in our social environment, it's the same thing. And I'm going to ask Daryl and Patrick to help me with this. Um, I, one of the things I grew up with is not labeling people. And I was always growing up with, if I had friends, I never said, this is my black friend, my Asian friend, my this friend. Even though I came from a pretty racist family who one day I brought my friend home and they said, Steve, you didn't tell us he was black. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to. <laughs> when I went to Japan for 15 years, I hated people saying, this is my foreigner friend. <laughs> you didn't and tell so, me he was five foot six. Yeah, and so, but, you know, and then Martin Luther King says, I want to be, you know, I hope someday that we are judged by the, our character, not the color of our skin. And, but what I hear 
So I've heard these, and here's my question to you guys is, because I get confused. I heard the other day, judge people by their character and see me for me, see my soul, see my talent, see my ability, and I'm going, great. I won't see color. And then the next day on the news is, well, if you don't see color, you don't see me. I'm like, wait a minute, pick one. And I'm confused. So Daryl Patrick, how can this old white guy not see color, but see color all at the same time? Because personal responsibility, I want to do the right thing, but I get confused because one day I'm told, judge me by my character, judge me by my ability, don't see my skin. And the next day I say, okay, I don't see it. And then I'm told I'm wrong. I don't see color. Now I'm wrong for not seeing color and I get confused. So help me out guys. <laughs> I need my friends to save Darryl? me. <laughs> you know, and this is, and this is, this is interesting because one of the things that I, I have totally said time and time again, you know, we, we, we say we want to be able to come together. We want to be treated as be treated as equals, but yet we have black history. Why do we have to have black history? Because because somebody thought that we should be included. We are included, okay. We are we are a part of history. We shouldn't have to make. We have to, shouldn't have to to uh, to to label it in order to be, be, to prove ourselves in history. Although I get it, because the history books don't recognize the contributions. That needs to change. So let's start there. Nobody start there. We want to say no. We want to be unto our own, but we want to be equal. Well, that that doesn't make any sense. You have to put, you have to sell, you have to be one or the other. So, I, you know, it's not about having black history. It's about our contribution to history. What is our contribution to history? And we got many, many contributions to history, okay? Half the world wouldn't run if it wasn't for some of the, history, some of the contributions we made. So we don't have to put a black label on it in order to say that we're part of, but we're part of this history based on our blackness. No, we're part of the history because we're human, because we made a difference, because we stepped up and went to a whole nother level, and we didn't let the we didn't let the resistance keep us down or hold us back. That's where it's true to breaking the chain of racism lies. Okay, you know you got You got to put yourself in that position every day, understanding that you know what I'm part of history. Okay, I look at my life and I tell always tell my son all the time. I said, look, you are a part of history. OK, I can go back and, and remind and remember that I at one time when I was a, a manager of a of a telecommunications company, I was actually one of four managers there. Every manager there outside of me had a degree. Every manager there outside of me had had so-called white privilege, if you want to say. But yet nobody turned out more product. Nobody turned out more more motivation. Nobody turned out more quality employees than I did. They were asking me, what's my secret? I didn't go to school. That was my secret. I learned, <laughs> I learned how I learned, I learned how to talk with folks. I learned how to communicate. I went to the schools of hard knocks and I learned from it. Okay. I didn't have to have my degree or the color of my skin to verify who I am. I know who I am. That's very good. It is so, interesting you mentioned that, Dara, because I you know recently started a course by with a guy named you know you know when he keep for us keep for us you know hopefully i'm pronouncing it right keep for us is one of the gurus in the world when it comes to relationship and in networking that is the number one skill i feel that i need to develop in my life at this skill in, 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 in at this stage to master the, you know, the relationships in my life, personal, professional, you know, to be able to sell myself. And that's the, the number one skill that I identify. And, and that's why you said, you pick a skill that you excel at, you master it, and you take your passion, which is personal, it's about you, I, passion, and transform it into a purpose and you recruit a lot of people to your cause. How do you recruit people to your cause if the first thing you do is to start calling everybody names? Yeah. Nobody will want to come around you. Re recruiting people to your cause, to your purpose, is how you get ahead. Period. 
You know, talking about networking, Patrick, I remember going to events and a lot of times they have name badges and then they have the company on the name badge. And I never really liked that because you go to the event, all of a sudden you start looking for where's all the 3M people. I want the 3M people. Don't even name, need a name badge. You walk up to them and say, hi, my name is Brad. What's your name? Why do you have to have name badges and labels on just so they're, I mean, I get it from a business standpoint, but it's kind of a similar kind of thing in society. You see someone, there's an Asian guy. Does he know karate? <laughs> you know? Stereotyping, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's what happens. And it doesn't matter what color because there's, there's nice people and there's not nice people. The idea is to take the nice people and make it more desirable so that the not so nice people want to play. Like there's a, a program that I had created quite a few years back. I actually even implemented, I called it the peace police. And what we did was we walked around at events with a citation booklet. And if someone did something nice, we'd give them a citation, which is a coupon to go get a free drink or a, go get a gift or a prize. So it incentivizes kindness. And then when all of a sudden people are doing stuff and they go, Oh my God, the peace police are coming. Hey, how you doing? I'm friendly. <laughs> so, so they could get the gift. Mm -hmm. So what if we had something like that in society where a bunch of guys are sitting on the street corner and they're pushing people around and instead they're doing nice stuff because here comes the peace police and they got gift certificates to target. You know, Brad, they, you know, uh, and I think it was in the nineties or early nineties when the book came out, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, random acts of kindness. Yeah. Bestseller. Never saw a bestseller saying random acts of violence or random, random acts of ignorance or random acts of whatever you want to, you know, fill in the blank. You know, we got to get back to understanding uh, in order to be understood is that you first have to be friendly in order to have a friend and stop thinking that, that you're entitled to something. I listen, I'll be the first one to tell you in my life, I have thought time and time again, a lot of things I thought I should have been entitled to, but it wasn't, and it wasn't until I finally made the decision that if I'm entitled to anything, I'm entitled to build a better life for myself regardless of the color of my skin. When I made that decision, life became workable and be able to do some great things. And now I'm in the business of helping other people realize that as well. Well, you know, a lot of this stuff has been creeping up on us little by little. Like you, I got a martial arts background and pretty soon the tournaments used to have first, second and third place. Then all of a sudden there's these little participation medals and everybody gets one. So you start feeling, well, where's my participation medal? I'm entitled. And you're not, you have to step up to first, second, or third place. You can't just get a participation medal. I can't tell you how many games I've been put out of, Brad, because of these, yeah. You know, I just, I was just, I was watching my granddaughter play basketball in a champion, in a, an eighth grade championship uh, earlier this year. And, uh, and you know, and, and somebody said, well, you know, we want to make sure we, we cheer them all on. Like, yeah, we want to make sure we cheer them all on, but that's my granddaughter, all right? Listen, I'm, good. I'm, I'm in her corner, all right? I'm going to the score every time that, you know, there's, you know just, there's, a, there's a drive that you have that we are, that we are literally put at a point where we just decentivize people to want to do more, okay? Yeah, and, you know, every, everybody's a winner. Well, hang on a second. No. Oh, you you're not going teaching to first when you're going to get a trophy you're, anyways. Right, you're not teaching them life. No. You're not teaching them life. You cannot you cannot win unless you break through resistance. You right. cannot win unless you go through something where you're going to learn, be stronger and be able to to master it. You have to learn how to do exactly the things you need to do in order to be able to be the person you've been called to be. You know, you got three guys sitting here right now who are all motivational speakers in different areas of life. And we would not have nothing that we can motivate others by if we didn't go through the fire ourselves first. Right. So the, the, the topic of social justice, what do you think, I mean, what is justice? What is just? I mean, some people, because one person murders somebody else, is it just that they get murdered also? The eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? Or is it just that they get um, ridiculed and scarlet lettered or something like that? Or would it be more just if they were um, um, fixed and were contributing to society? Maybe that would be a better justification or making it more just. What do you think on the, what, what is social justification? Or I think a lot of times we have to be careful with words we use. And 
I wonder though, if people out there raising their hands for justice shouldn't change the word to vengeance. Because I'm not quite sure if they really want yeah. justice. I wonder if that's they what's want happening. vengeance. That's, what, that's what's happening, it is vengeance. Because if justice. I'm a just person, then I'm not gonna commit an unjust act against another because I understand justice is the idea of fairness and equal treatment to all. So if I really want justice, then I wouldn't use words like no justice, no peace, because peace by itself is not just, or violence by itself is causing, as Daryl brought up in his story, what is justice if I am hurting another person? Then therefore I am not just. So I'm hypocritical calling yeah. for justice and saying if I don't get what I want, I'm gonna commit more unjust acts. So I wonder if we shouldn't change that to no vengeance, no peace, because that may be what they really want, because if justice is served, that means in our country there's a fair trial, a jury by your peers, and it's a, a, it's, the evidence is presented. So what happens if the evidence is presented and the jury says not guilty? Justice has been served. Technically, they went through it. But will all those people go, oh, yay, justice is served. Okay, we're good. No, they're going to run out there and burn more buildings down. Right. Because I don't think they really want justice. I think they want vengeance. And so and if we're going to speak difference. justice, let's be just. Well, there's that uh, presenter, she's gotten pretty famous now, that Candace Owens. Um, she said if, uh, if Black Lives Matter would go in front of the abortion clinics, then she would be wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt because there's a lot of blacks that are getting killed in abortion clinics. Right, correct. And, and that's a great point. If Black Lives Matter, there was a police officer who was killed doing the in a riot so is is his life not does his life not matter um is there anybody that is going to give scholarship for his kid to go to the university oh it did not fit somebody's agenda it did not fit somebody's plan to get 250 million dollars from the you know nfl or somebody's plan to get these million dollars from this person trying to um, counter, you know, be, you know, anti something. The, the basic point here is, I believe it starts with what our core value is. This entire thing about diversity and inclusion has gotten to the point where it puts everybody in a bunch of boxes and allow them to sit there and be manipulated Oh, this is the black community. This is the this other community. This is the this other community. And we all sit in all of these boxes and quickly realize, oh, but I need Brad. If I sit in this community, this community is doing is not getting me where I want to go. I need to be in that group, and it is not defined by race. It, it is defined by mindset. So I sit here with you, Daryl, Steve, because we are more aligned on similar mindset irrespective of a lot of other differences. I remember years ago, I went through a program where I, I was independent. I felt that's just me, I'm independent. I don't need other people, I can make this happen. And I had this aha moment in this seminar where in order to be independent, I need somebody else to be independent of. Therefore, I can't be independent because I need somebody to be independent of. Brad, so, there, that's there right is through. a parable from Africa, okay? There is an African yeah. parable. There is a parable from Africa that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. Yeah. And if you want to go far, you go with others. Sure. Because the, the, it, it basically comes from the fact that if you're in this big old forest and you're going alone, you can count yourself being eaten by the tiger or the lion. But if you're going together, when something happens, you guys can fight together, you can, you know, laugh together, but you're still moving. And that's the point. So I, I don't know. It's just people just being manipulated so much. You know, I find it funny. Uh, I was, I guess I had mentioned I was down in Chicago uh, last weekend 
and or not, a week and four last two weekends ago. And I went down to see my mom, went to the old neighborhood I grew up in and what have you. And I grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly 100% African-American. Talking about a neighborhood that had about 17 and maybe 20,000 people in it, okay? And literally, I, 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 if, if, in order to go and see a different color skin, you had to go over in the high park or you had to go to downtown to go see somebody different. Well, it's funny because here I am coming back to see my mom in the same house I grew up in some 50 some odd years ago. And I go in and, it, and, 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 and our house sits right here. The woman on one side is white. The woman on the other side is white. The neighbor across the street is white now. And so is there, and so the other people on the block. Mm. And I sit there and say to myself, I said, boy, I said, talk about change. I said, here we are down here talking about being, being a particular race or creed, and yet everyone is moving right into your neighborhood and you can't even take five minutes to say hi to them. You know, mm. and I was sitting there talking to everybody, they go, you know, just talking to them if I ran into them, of course. You know, just trying to, you know, you know, see what's going on, see how things are doing. And, you know, I, I, I find it fascinating that when Patrick brought up a minute ago about, about Black Lives Matter, one thing I find fascinating uh, is this, is that uh, we, like, I go back to that statement I made earlier about finding a tangible devil to follow, uh, to find a tangible devil to blame for your situation. I find it fascinating that while I was down there, on Father's Day weekend, they had over 104 murders. Black on black crime were the majority of them, okay? In the process of this, three children under the age of eight were shot and killed. Now, moving to the following weekend, the week I was down there, weekend I was down there, literally over 60 people were shot and killed. Another four were children between five months old and six years old, killed. One, well, I'll take that back. There was one young man who, uh, well, no, young, young, one young girl, I think she was like uh, six, seven, six, seven years old, who, uh, who was shot but, but, wasn't, but uh, was able to recover. As a matter of fact, the doctors knew she was fine because she told the doctors, don't mess with my earrings. And that was that. <laughs> and everybody made a big, big deal of that on the news, you know, about how funny that was. But the thing was that was interesting, though, is that the, one of the neighborhoods where the shooting took place, the business community came together and offered up a $50,000 bounty for the, for the information or the people who, who did this heinous crime. And they offered to be able to pay the legal fees of the person that did the crime. You heard me right. They offered legal fees to the person who did the crime if they came forward, that they would pay their legal fees. The next day after that, the police superintendent got on the TV begging, begging for people to come forward and tell about what's going on. And they keep saying, this has got to stop. This is too much. This has got to stop. There was not one person representing Black Lives Matter in those neighborhoods, not one, not one. Because they were too busy out protesting about other issues that valid may be still what's happening in your own community. Where was Black Lives Matter about these babies that were shot and killed? Where was Black Lives Matter about the, about the 107, 107 people that were, that, were, that, were, that were gunned down? Where were they? If you're gonna have Black Lives Matter, it doesn't only have matter if they attacked by white police officers. You know, or does it matter, or does it or does it matter when anybody does a crime against your own race or humanity as a whole? I think that's where it is getting clear. Maybe the uh, the gripe is white police officers against black people. And it might, if they would just be clear about what they're doing rather than just putting a blanket over all of it and then not supporting, you know, if, it, if black lives matter, then they matter everywhere. That's, that's not why there's sexy, all that, Brad. That's not sexy. That, that's where all that uh, controversy is. It doesn't sell is papers, with, Brad. Huh? <laughs> that doesn't sell papers, Brad. It, 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 it doesn't well, bring the, the mission. <laughs> that's the truth. That's what, that's what frustrates me. You're, I, Brad, I, you're, you're, going, you're, you're, you're not selling papers. You're not getting media, social media involved on that. <laughs> So, I, Daryl, I, and why do you think, Daryl, then your voice and your message is clear 
why is it not heard at a national level or even a state level? Why, where are the people, where are you at that level and how come more people haven't heard your voice? Because I know there's a whole bunch more people out there who think just the way you do. I think it's being suppressed. Yeah, but why? I, I, why? I think there's because another- Because of money. I, I, I think definitely it's money and the controversy creates the money. Like people are watching CNN. <laughs> You know why? Because the advertisers are paying for it. And I think it's definitely a money thing. And then you could go even a step further and you might think, oh, there's some big conspiracy theory going on. There's the people, you don't, the, the puppet masters doing something. But I think it, if you just look at it, the money, I think the yeah, money is an issue. I mean, look at the National Football Association. They just gave $200 million, $250 million to social justice or something against racism and all the money. How, how do you think that is going to translate into that little kid who doesn't have food or who, who doesn't have a place to sleep? How, how do you think it's going to translate? By the time a get from the person who get the 150, you know, the $500,000 salary and he got all of his buddies, all connected in the organization, making $1 million. And you it, know, I think it's the, just the money. It, I think it definitely is the money. But if you look at the whole, like the human mindset or the thinking, they like that, that combat duality, you know, like boxing, like football, there's teams and there's controversy and competition. They like that. So what if we could just say, let's take the death part out of it and just put this into a, competitive thing where the blacks can go after the white police people, but not to murder, but to fight. Maybe just put them in the ring and just have a competition and you can sell tickets and then nobody dies. And we still- If you- <laughs> if, if, if you did something like that called Celebrity Deathmatch years ago, and, and it was in claymation. Uh, so <laughs> don't I think do the death thing. Don't do the death thing. Don't do the death <laughs> thing, right. But you know, it's 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 fascinating about how we can come to 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 a point where we can get that 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 done. And I think what they're tr what they're trying to do when this new defunding the police department is supposed to solve everything in the process. Well, that's just ignorance gone to seed. Because first of all, if you defund the police department and if you get rid of the police, then when somebody's raping your daughter, who do you call? Ghostbusters? No. You gotta call somebody to get to get to make something happen. And then when you try to go after that person to try to do something, that you done messed up somebody else's family if you did something to them. So now they gonna come back at you, and then you got you got civil unrest everywhere. Yeah, they you need know, to re-educate. Yeah, and don't think and don't think you could call like the state police or something like that. They've already said if you defund them, don't come looking for us. We ain't coming. Well, it's gotten to be a position that nobody wants to have. I don't want that job. So when you go back to what you know, Jera said in about Chicago. Can you count some of the biggest names that have been connected to Chicago? Some of the biggest names. I, you know, I'm not going to call the names, but count some of the biggest names you know that have been connected to Chicago. And you know, have you heard? Any one of them say anything? No, because it doesn't fit their agenda. Some of the biggest names we know. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it is a, a culture almost, the Chicago urban culture. It's getting, anyways, this is getting kind of depressing. So let's bring it back up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> We've been going, I don't know if we solved anything, but. Um, I think a big piece of this is just to get in a place where we can have a conversation and find out what is, where's the pain coming from? How can we help and get back to a neutral place just to be able to, because you can't solve it by fighting and yelling and no. screaming. It doesn't solve anything. All it does is makes another person mad. So that's what I was saying. If you're going to fight, might as well do it in the ring and sell tickets. <laughs> just no killing. <laughs> So let's kind of go around and wrap this up and we'll go in the same order and uh, some, some final notes on uh, any possible solutions. We discovered the problems and you can't, uh, 
solve the problem with the same uh, mind that created it, right? So oh. Steve, go ahead and give us a summary. I think for of what me, you it's, it's really coming down to understanding that at our core, we're all, we're more alike than we are different. And I get people saying, well, my experience, yeah, your experience is different, but you know what? I guarantee it. The same things that cause your heart pain will cause my heart pain. The same thing that caused you to smile will cause me to smile. So my challenge to anybody out there is this, get in the habit of taking time to meet somebody who looks, thinks, and believes different than you, sit down, have a cup of coffee, and find something in common and learn something from one another. Then spend time together. Familiarity wipes out fear. When you're familiar with somebody, you stop being afraid of that somebody. So if you're afraid of a certain race or not sure what to think, then go spend time with them and get to know them and enjoy them. And that familiarity will breed friendship. Get out there and find someone who looks, thinks, and believes different than you. Get to know them. Make a new friend. That'll lead progress right into Patrick Courage because it takes <laughs> courage to you know, confront, so talk to somebody you don't know. Patrick? Steve is right. Steve, I mean, buy, you know, cook, cook something, cook a food, uh, you know, make a, a, some kind of get together around food and have a conversation. Again, why do you see something this way? Again, we're trying to seek to understand. This person could just be doing what they have always known. It may not be it may not be anything pertaining to, you know, something malicious, but this is how I have always responded. And when we get to the point where we un understand, how, you know, how we are behaving, then we can explain to somebody else, this is how you come across to me. This is how this come across to me. And so, it has to start with a conversation, and one of the best places to start is food. We got kind of a hosted, you know, an event this last weekend with one of my friends. I gave the guy some hot pepper from Liberia. His his face is all red, but we laughing, you know. Yeah. And, well, Patrick, I think that's a great idea because there are some commonalities globally. Everybody eats different food. And I think there's another thing that's common in all over the world is music. So music and food, if we can just get together and do that, and then I'm going to bring this over to Daryl and he can share with us how to motivate us to take action on this and have a picnic. <laughs> I, you know, I think when I, when I think about that, uh, about, about that whole scenario, one of the things I, that I, I love is that uh, back in the back in the nineties, when the Bulls were when the Chicago Bulls were making their championship basketball run, and they, they you know throughout the time you know when you when you have a championship game, you got a lot of celebrities there and what have you. One of my favorite scenes that of celebrities they showed together is they showed uh, Jesse Jackson with Bob Dole, two guys who were total polar opposite of each other, total different views of uh, you know of, of politically, whatever you name it. The whole nine yards and yet they found each other at a basketball game and they would be talking to each other at halftime just 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 talking and having a good time they were laughing they were they, you know they were having beverages together the next thing you know you saw was that at later games they actually started sitting together and watching the game together i say that to say this stop confusing your views with racism. You can have a different opinion and still be able to get along. I want people in my life who have different opinions than me. I want people in my life who think differently than me. That, that perspective can be totally different than mine to the point that we can even be red mad at each other. But dude, <laughs> Let's go grab a bite. I'm hungry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> that's really, I mean, really. I mean, that's where we need to be at, okay? When we can do that, it changes everything. 
it changes the fact that, man, it makes no difference the color of my skin, man. You, man, I didn't know you liked Chinese food, man. I like wontons too. You know, <laughs> imagine that. Well, you want to sit here and fight over this and fight over that? You know, it's almost it's almost funny. It's almost like when you get these these clashes between races, it's like they almost go and they punch into a clock. And then, there's, then they go at it. Then once it's over, see you tomorrow at five. You got it, Bob. We'll see you then. And they go this every way. Look, we gotta, we gotta stop this. We gotta get back to the basics, man. How did, how did Nelson Mandela, after he got out of prison, unite a country on a with a soccer team? Because he found something that everybody could agree on. Yeah. He found something everybody could agree on. And that's where we need to be. Let's get to a point where we can agree on something. We can agree to disagree. We can keep our political views and our opinions. But man, that doesn't stop us from going down to Army and Lou and get a, a nice steak. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I'm going to cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> over, man. You can feed your hot peppers. Just leave those <laughs> hot peppers in Liberia. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like that spicy food. Well, you guys, this has been a lot of fun, and I think it's been educational and enlightening, and I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, beam this up to the universe and uh, YouTube and let people find it. Hopefully, we'll make some changes, and if we could share it out there and uh, see what happens in this world. I'll give you the raw file, too, in case you want to upload it to your own uh, home server. So I appreciate you taking time, Steve. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, Thank you, you. Daryl. And uh, have a good night. Peace. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate you, man. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank Brad. You. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.